All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to MCC. We are so glad that you are here. And of course, let me start by saying Merry Christmas. And uh, Josh hit on it earlier, but I want to remind you all, especially you men out there, there's only eight shopping days, including today, to get your wife that special something. So if you don't have it under the tree, don't blame Josh or I. We did our job to remind you. And women, little lovely wives, I'm sorry if you get left out because I did all I could. So I am sorry. Merry Christmas. And kids, you have eight days left to be good if you're still in here, any of you. So eight days left. Woo! Man, I know for the high school students it's going to be rough because they have finals this week. So please be praying for them as they have to do their finals this week. And I know they're all very excited about that. Um, Katie, I see that big smile. It's finals time. Yay, yeah. All right. Well, with one week to go, can you believe there's one week to go? Man, it's crazy. With one week to go, we better get to today's message as we continue our sermon series called Reclaim Christmas. I want you to think about something this morning, this specifically. God is an amazing father, amen? amen. And I'm, for one, am glad that he doesn't think like I did as a father, okay? I remember that right after Polly would uh, let me know that we were going to have a child, and this includes both times, both times she did this. After she told me this, uh, my mind was consumed with thoughts and questions and prayers. Things like, um, how did this happen? No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, things like, would it be a boy or girl? Would they be healthy? What would they be like? What will they look like? Um, what will they grow up to be? Will they love Jesus? Those kind of questions. And, and I'd spend time in prayer going, Lord, please help me not to mess this fatherhood thing up too much, please. Or, Lord, what did you create them to do? How can I help that along? You see, when a child is born, most humans are consumed with thoughts like these, thoughts of their future, thoughts of what their life will look like for the child. When a child is born, all we adults can do is think about and, and dream about um, what they're going to be or, or what they're going to do or how they're going to live their lives. We don't think about their death, which is reasonable. No one's wrong for that. If you're a parent who thought all those things, it's okay. However, God's thought as a father were different. His son is the one child whose birth was directly connected to his death. This morning, as we reflect on that first Christmas, I want to remind you that Jesus was born to die. Our main text today, Matthew 1, uh, chapter 1, verses, verse 21, points out this to us. It points out this simple truth. Now, I want you to remember something. This is the text, all right? This is the text that comes right from the dream that Joseph had had where an angel appeared to him and said, and you can go to verse 20 if you want to see it, but he said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And this was important that he'd said this so that Joseph would marry, 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 um, so that the line of David, so that uh, Jesus would be born into the family line of King David. This was important. And then the angel goes on to say, for the child has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then the angel gets to our verse today, and he says, She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What a verse. What a statement by the angel. You see, this verse answers two very important questions for us this morning. The first one, who came? Who was it that came that first Christmas? Well, the verse uh, tells us who it is by reminding us that Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit. It was apart from normal relations with a man. The virgin birth is important to, um, to affirming the deity of Jesus. If Jesus was born of a human father instead of the Holy Spirit, then he is not God in human flesh. He would only have been a human, a man, just a normal man like any of the rest of us. His existence would have also begun at conception. And then he could not have been the eternal God in human flesh. But Jesus claimed that he was sent into this world from heaven, which assumes, of course, an existence before he got here. He told the Jews this, before Abraham was born, I am. The virgin birth is important also because it shows us that Jesus 
is that by coming from the Holy Spirit, by being uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he was sinless. He was blameless. If he had been born with two human parents, he would have been born in sin like all the other humans since Adam and Eve. And if that were the case, folks, he couldn't have died for all our sins. He couldn't have been our substitute. He would have had his own sin to deal with. He would have died only for his sin. But that's not the case. This baby, baby Jesus, was human because he was born of Mary. But he is God. He came to earth as God, as the Son of God. Who came as Jesus? That's right, God's Son, born to a virgin. It's, he, is no, uh, he is none other than the eternal God in human flesh. He was the only one because of who he was that could have died in our place, be the sacrifice for our sins. And that is the reason. That's the primary reason he came to earth, which answers our second question for us today. Why did Jesus come? Guess what? He came to save us. He came to save his people from their sins. After all, what's in a name? Well, it's all in the name in this case. You shall name him Jesus. The Hebrew word for that, of course, is Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation or the Lord saves. His ministry will first and foremost be about spiritual salvation, salvation of God's people by removing the wall, that wall that's between us and God because our sins created that wall. And Jesus has come to say, tear it down, take it out. Charles Spurgeon pointed this out in a sermon he he. He wrote entitled Jesus, and he said that since the Father knows Jesus perfectly, when he directed that he be named Jesus, he was giving him the best, most appropriate name possible. By giving Jesus the name, the Father commissioned him to save sinners. So by calling him Jesus, he has one job, right? Save sinners. This constitutes the ground of our appeal to God for salvation. Now, just in case Joseph and maybe us as we read the Bible today didn't grasp the importance of the name he was given, the angel spells it out clearly in the last half of that verse, doesn't he? For he will save his people from their sins. Sin, it's our universal problem. It's our spiritual cancer that has inflicted every single man and woman. The Bible tells us that, we, um, that none of us are righteous. All have sinned, what? And fall short of what? The glory of God. Yes. And as a result of our sins, we all deserve death. But Jesus, our Savior, has come to give us our salvation from the punishment of sin. He took the guilt of all our sins upon himself and died in our place. The beautiful, innocent baby was destined to go from the manger to the cross. Salvation from sin means that our sins are forgiven and that God no longer charges any of us for the sins. He doesn't hold them against us. Anybody glad for that this morning? Amen. Salvation from sin also means that we are saved from the effects of sin, right? The salvation Jesus brought has reconciled us with God so that we are no longer his enemies. We talked about this just a couple weeks ago, but we're also members of his household. And salvation is possible for all. Because God sent his son, right? Remember, remember, we heard this already this morning, but remember what the angels said, what they told the shepherds, Luke 2, verses 10 and 11. And so the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. Man, that's some good news. That's some great news. You know, the funny thing is, and some of you probably heard this before, but if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator, some teachers, right? If our greatest need had been technology, we, some of us would be in trouble, but if it had been technology, God would have sent us an IT professional. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us a great financial advisor. And if our greatest need had been pleasure, 
well, maybe God would have sent us an entertainer or a comedian, a singer, something that we could enjoy, right? But our greatest need was forgiveness from our sin. So God sent us a Savior, His Son, Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. God knows what we need. Jesus, who paid the ultimate price for us so that we don't need to pay any price again. All we need to do is believe in Him and accept the price He paid for us. We got to accept it, though, right? The story of Jesus is the greatest story ever told. It is a story that is summarized in the most famous verse in the Bible, good old John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have... Yes! The hope we already talked about during this series. Right? Eternal life is a free gift. It was not... Now, it wasn't free for God. It was very costly for God. The life of His only Son was the price paid. But for us, it's free. And like any gift, we all, have to, uh, we all have to do something to enjoy it and to receive it, and that's accept it. We receive this gift of eternal life by believing in Jesus. Now, let me clarify, that doesn't mean we just have a mental understanding of the facts about Jesus. He's a good guy, came to earth, died on the cross for him. Yeah, no, there's more to it than that. It means we place our trust in the work of Jesus on the cross to make us acceptable to God. And we quit, and this is the hard part, I don't know for you, but for me it's the hard part, we quit trying to make ourselves good enough. We can't do it on our own. And we accept the perfect sacrifice of Jesus to make us right with Him. So let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, friends and family, as we celebrate Christmas this season, spend time at the manger. Remember, why the baby came. Take some time. Talk to him. Thank him. Remember. Remember. Let's make Christmas a real joy this season by reclaiming the true meaning of Christmas. Guess what? You're not alone. God is with us. Your sins are forgiven. And we get to spend eternity with Him. Christmas means so much more than what the world offers, doesn't it? We can claim or reclaim salvation with a grateful heart. We can receive Jesus. We can bow before Him in awe and adoration and worship Him again. Or maybe for the first time for some of you. The question is, will you? Now I can see on some of your faces, especially some of you people who have been around for a long time, you're, you're the well-seasoned individuals in the crowd today, right? I can see in your head, you're saying, Pastor, why do I need to reclaim salvation? I'm already saved. I accepted him. I, I've, he's my savior. I've been baptized. I've repented. Okay, well, by reclaim, I mean something just a little bit different than that. Okay, I want you to think about these three questions. Do you live your life like your eternal salvation is secure? Or do worries get in your head? Or do you wonder, is God going to take care of me? Second question, do you have the true peace of God in your life? Or does the world struggle, get the best of you from time to time? Finally, the third question, does the love of God consume you and overflow into your desire to share it with anyone and everyone you come across? If the answer to all three of those questions is yes, you're right. There's no need to reclaim. You've got it. You go. Let Jesus flow out of you, through you, around you. You go. Hold on to it and keep going. But if one of those questions or two or three you're struggling with, grab back a hold of Jesus. Reclaim that salvation that is guaranteed to you. Say, no, I am saved. The hope of Jesus, the peace of Jesus, the love of Jesus, he saved me. I have all of that. World, you're not getting to me. World, you're not consuming me. I am consumed by God the Father, by the, His Son, Jesus, and I want to share His love. That's reclaiming Christmas. That's reclaiming the salvation that Jesus gave us. Martin Luther said it this way, if anyone stands firm and right on this point, 
that Jesus Christ is the true God and true man who died and rose again for us, all the other articles of Christian faith will fall into place for him and firmly sustain him. In other words, we can try to reclaim the hope that we talked about already or the peace and the love of Christmas. But if we don't reclaim our salvation, if we don't stake our whole lives on the fact that Jesus was born in a manger to die for us on a cross, then everything else doesn't really matter. That is our foundation. That's what we base everything on. He came to earth to bring all that other stuff. And that all that other stuff, love, peace, hope, that all comes with it. But we stake our claim on the salvation he brought. If we do all that, stake our claim on that, and let everything else just grow out of that in and around us, we will then truly be what we're desired to be around here. For God, for you. We will be his hands. We will be his feet. Today's takeaway is a personal one, and I want you to make it personal to yourselves. To claim or reclaim Christmas, I must believe that Jesus was born to die so that I may live. Man, what a promise. This is the greatest news ever. We can't get so caught up in this Christmas that we live in as far as the culture, the way they live it, that we are distracted from sharing the good news. Of course, the birth of Christ is important. It's important. He had to come to die. It's important that he came. Right? But never once, never once did the disciples go out to the world proclaiming the birth of the Messiah. That's not what they proclaimed. They proclaimed that the Messiah had come. He had been crucified, risen, and he's coming again. That is the full gospel of Christmas. Not that a babe, just a baby came and some shepherd showed up and a little later the wise men came. That's, that's, that's a great story and it's important. But the rest of the story makes the Christmas gospel complete, right? Think about it this way. If we just focused on the baby in the manger, it would be like a Formula One driver starting his car and just sitting in the pits revving up the engine while the race happened. Right? Just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Ah, sounds good. But I'll be fast today. Just happy to have their car start. And their motor run and everything's going good. They just, but they just sit in the pits. That is not all the race is about. The race is about so much more. It's getting that car going, started. And ultimately, it's about running out there on the course, finishing the race, and hopefully winning the race. We've got to tell the whole story. As Paul Harvey said, this is the rest of the story. And if you just tell the manger, you're forgetting the best part of the story. Okay? That's what we have to do today. During this Christmas season, when we celebrate Christ's entry into this world, let's not leave our family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, whoever you meet, let's not leave them in the pits at the start line, not even running the race. Let's show them through God's Word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, how to finish the race and receive the prize of salvation through Jesus. Let's share the whole good news of Christmas. Let's share the gospel. To close, I want to share a poem called The Days Before Christmas. And I've kind of adapted it for MCC today. So here we go. It was the days before Christmas and all through the church. The pews are all filling as everyone was perched. The hands, they're shaking each other and greetings abound. Soon I'll go up to the pulpit and prepare to expound. I spent the whole week trying to hear what God was saying, studying, reading, and earnestly praying. The third week worship team has practiced and taken great care. They're singing this morning. For weeks, for days, they've prepared. This Christmas season, we've had sermons of hope, peace, and love, of angels and a baby sent from above. I prayed that this week the message would stew the hearts of all at MCC and move you folks beyond the pews. This is a season so full of distractions, but we know that in this world, we have no satisfaction. If we don't share the whole gospel of Christ, not just his birth, but his paying our price. If we speak of the manger, not of the cross, the fullness of Jesus somehow gets lost. This Christmas season, folks, do Jesus a favor. Reclaim Christmas 
and share Christ the Savior. Let's pray.